Welcome back to Whiteout Weekly as we are coming off a pretty heated game against Washington before they had to pull the plug as we ended up dominating them 35-6, to not allowing a touchdown. And the best part of the week was this week, the first ever college football playoff bracket. Penn State's ranked number four, I guess, in the AP poll, but would be the sixth seed in the playoff. And just seeing that, like all the Photoshopped ones before the season, those were cool. But seeing the bracket in live time of the actual matchups that we might get, seeing some SEC teams having to travel north, mm-hmm. some ACC teams having to travel west, some Big Ten teams having to travel west, and vice versa. It just, it was one of the most beautiful things I think I've ever laid my eyes upon. Driving SEC country absolutely bonkers seeing four of the top five teams being from the Big Ten. <laughs> it, means, it, means, it means more in the SEC for sure. <laughs> It's not even over, and they're already like up, like up in arms, ready to take down this entire playoff racket that the yeah. NCAA is up to. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like you said, Penn State ranked number four, six seed would at this current juncture would be hosting Lane Kiffin and the Ole Miss Ole Miss Rebels in a rematch of last year's Peach Bowl. But seeing Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss have to travel to to Beaver Stadium and a potential primetime whiteout playoff game would be some sort of spectacle. And that would be, like you said, that's the cool part about this and uh, looking good for, for the Nets. Yeah. Ole Miss coming off that big win over Georgia. And I had not get myself. I like um, get up occasionally, but I just can't get myself to watch like a full 20 minutes of any ESPN show. It is just pure garbage. So Paul Feinbaum apparently went off. I saw some clips of that railing on Penn state and saying George is better, even though they have two losses, which their two losses are, I mean, two good losses Mm -hmm. kind of equals win. So they could, basically they could be tied with Penn State. So I, I kind of agree with them here. Not gonna lie. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting to see from the committee's perspective with the expanded field what in these first two first couple weeks of them releasing the rankings what they're valuing, and the the point that was being made is is strength of schedule definitely or at least in Georgia's case, doesn't seem to be there. Because, I mean, Georgia's played just about one of the hardest, if not the hardest, schedule yeah, they're, they're in all of college football with them. going at Texas, at Bama, yeah, uh, at Ole Miss. You know, they destroyed Texas. So the argument was being made, the fact that Texas is ahead of Georgia. And then in Penn State's case, you know, strike the schedule, obviously not there. And then in the lines of one big game we had. Uh, didn't get it done, but ultimately college football is a any given Saturday type of type of environment, especially these days and with the mega conferences. So survive in advance has always been the mentality for Penn State. Granted, now we do need to make sure that we can win those big games, but at you know, at this current juncture, they're they're standing in a good spot. The argument also being made that Indiana should be ahead of Penn State at this point, which given Indiana what they've been able to accomplish them being undefeated, you you definitely have an argument there. Putting this year in a vacuum, obviously Indiana, it's been nothing to write home about for several years or just about an eternity. But there's a lot of good conversation and it's been interesting to see what the committee is valuing on a week-in and week-out basis. Yeah, that's actually good to know that they're not – well, I guess it's – so if they're not valuing strength of schedule, is that going to sort of entice teams to when they schedule their non-conference games to be like, all right, we're not going to do these big, you know, neutral game sites where we get the 10 seed versus the three seed in week one. It's going to be like, no, we're just going to go FCS, 
Mac FCS. You know what I mean? It it very well could, especially again with the conferences being becoming mega conferences where your conference slate, you know, the the Big Ten, for example, is an, a very new Big Ten where your Penn State's conference slate, for example, has always just been Ohio State, Michigan. And now you got Oregon in the mix. You got USC, who I know is having a down year, but they have the ability to recruit at a high level and be a premier program. You got Washington that they're able to get back to national championship type form like they were last year. So adding all these teams definitely makes the conference slate that much tougher. And the the committee, again, has shown that it's more of a just take care of business each week mentality and what they're valuing at least these first couple of weeks again here. So it, it very well could influence how these schools are, are scheduling their, their out of conference. Yeah. Looking at Georgia's schedule, like I said, they have UMass, like, like I said, with the cupcake teams, mm-hmm. yeah, UMass, then not really a cupcake team, but George, Georgia tech to uh, mm-hmm. finish out the season mm-hmm. and Tennessee this week. Forgot yep. that number seven, big game. But, Big one that could definitely get them right back into it. Yeah, Ole Miss's schedule, it, it's not too impressive. They had the big road win um, that looks amazing now against uh, South Carolina, mm-hmm. 7-3. Beat Georgia, but then they got to go at Florida, at the Swamp at noon. Mm-hmm. And then they're at home against Mississippi State. So, yeah, I could definitely see the Rebels being in that college football playoff. And another team that just shook me when I saw them, BYU, being the number four team. team, Or the four seed, I should say. Yeah, a wild ending to that one uh, against Utah or the Holy War. Is that for for the ACC championship or what would that be for? Uh, Big 12. <clears throat> Big 12, Big 12. Right now, Big 12 is shaping up to be BYU versus Coach Prime and the Colorado Buffs. Coach Prime, how about it? People really wrote him off after just one season. Mm-hmm. Like, really, like, very quickly wrote him off. Yeah. So, big picture college football news again. That was one of the, the coolest most beautiful sights I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I just had a wedding in Spain this summer. And I was still probably top three this year. No offense to Jackson, if you're listening. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But let's go to Penn State before we head into our preview. A little housekeeping. Got a couple of players banged up. Denied Dennis Sutton's missed a couple games with a ham or just the one game with the hamstring injury. Yeah, he's been getting some snaps more so in reserve action. I think in the Washington game, late in that game, he was still in that ball game just trying to get right. Um, but he had missed the game prior or wasn't able to go against against Ohio State or was very limited in that game. So he was able to get get onto the field last week in that in that whiteout game and he's been he's been practicing this week still seems to be a little bit hampered so we'll we'll see um this should hopefully be a game where he's not needed to be relied upon a ton but still want to make sure that he's healthy especially when talking about a playoff push playoff run yeah those those hamstring injuries are nothing to play around with you can unfortunately pop those things at any time Mm -hmm. And not bigger, but more pertaining to the offense in terms of production, Nick Singleton went down. That was a scary sight, but was seen practicing uh, during the week these past few days. We don't really know what his usage is going to be. His usage is going to be against uh, Purdue. You know, we could easily blow them out. He could play a series or two. Mm -hmm. Um, given the context of the injury. But behind him, Cam Wallace had that season-ending injury, unfortunately. Would have loved to see him get some reps. Yeah. Uh, Besides him, freshman Quentin Martin, he's been bad on some injuries. So they turned to Corey Smith 
in garbage time. They actually went off 50 or five rushes, 98 yards. So Franklin said that Corey Smith is at a totally different point than he was during training camp with his progression. And that was definitely seen in garbage time against Washington. But it looks like it's going to be Catron, Singleton. And then say we grab a huge lead. Do we just run Corey Smith for the entire second half? It could be. Uh, I would love to be able to see Quentin Martin if he's if he's able to go to get some action there as well. The true freshman, one of the top recruits in the state of Pennsylvania coming into this year. But, yeah, Corey Smith un- unfortunately caught a lot of flack this week from not being able to break off that's or finish that 78-yard run for a touchdown. He was getting some uh, Come on now. Come caught on. from the side with not having that breakaway speed. But none the, nonetheless, that was a huge game for – for the true freshman. So yeah, I would definitely expect him to get some more run in this one. I, I don't think you want to overburden definitely not Singleton, but even Katron got a 20 exactly. carries yeah. in that whiteout yeah. game. So that was a heavy workload for him. So you definitely want to make sure that you keep both him and Singleton healthy and, and geared up for, for again, for not just the rest of the season, but also a playoff push. Yeah. Cause you, you don't want to see what we saw against Washington with Nick Singleton hopping off the field in a playoff game, potentially. That would absolutely suck. So getting into week 12, the final stretch, final three games for our Penn State and Indy Lions. We got two back-to-back road games against, like we said, Purdue, and then we go to Minnesota and finish at home against the Maryland Terrapins. But we'll start with the game in West Lafayette. 3.30 kickoff at Ross Aid Stadium against the worst team in the Big Ten, the 1-8 Purdy Boilermakers at 3.30, like I said, on CBS. And I actually looked up that. So Purdue has 85 points scored. In Big Ten play, I think Ohio State's allowed only 75, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty bad. Yeah. They're, uh, they're ranked low in pretty much every metric I'm about to give you. Uh, yeah, so- it's much, much worse against the, the upper echelon of opponents that they've been unfortunately slated against recently i think they've been outscored 146 to 7 something to that extent against the the top tier big 10 teams yeah their schedule's brutal they face facing <laughs> Vienna too to finish out the season yeah i think four of their last six is against top 10 opponents yeah terrible schedule <laughs> terrible schedule on their <laughs> on their part and the line reflects that it opened at 20 and a half. It's now up to 29 on DraftKings. The over under opened at 49 and a half. That's up to 51. So the picture on Purdue, I'll paint it for you right now. Their offensive line's terrible. He. Key, key, key to knowing that this team stinks. 24 sacks allowed in nine games. That's actually the only third worst in the Big Ten behind Michigan State, who's allowed 27, and Illinois, who's allowed 28. In terms of offensive efficiency in the red zone, they are tied for 118th in the FBS with the Akron Zips. They scored 14 touchdowns and seven field goals on 28 red zone attempts. And good news is Penn State tied for 13th red in red zone defense. And they're actually tied with Sam Houston State, put up some numbers in the red zone. Penn State's only allowed eight touchdowns and seven field goals on 21 opponents' trips to their red zone so far. And that stood out to me as I was looking at the stats, that they've only allowed 21 red zone trips so far mm-hmm. that's very very impressive mm-hmm. 
going to the defensive side of the ball. Last in the Big Ten, giving up a whopping 446.4 yards per play. That's 121st in the FBS. In perspective, that's between Wake Forest and Tulsa. Mm -hmm. They also have the worst run defense in the Big Ten, allowing almost 200 yards per game. 5.05 yards. Putting that 05 in there for a reason. Uh, Per rush. Again, 118th in the FBS, allowing only one more yard per game. Then Louisiana Monroe is putting some of those stats into perspective. Uh, some good stats for them. They are some spoiler makers. I think they had that nick, they've had that nickname thrown at them a couple times. They've won more games against top two AP teams than any other school in FBS history according to Purdue and Phil Steele and have 17 top five wins in school history, which I think is first in the FBS. But this team isn't it in all the big stat categories that I went through. They ranked 117th in the FBS or lower out of 133 teams. So they're in the lower 15% in 12 of the big, like 18 stat categories. So just an awful team on paper, but they can still put up a fight led by head coach Ryan Walters in his second year. What's he got possibly going on to try to pull an upset against us, Dave? Yeah, it's been tough sledding for for Walters. He's in his second year as head coach, like you said. Fired the offensive coordinator midway through their, I want to say it was four games into the year. Fired Graham Harrell, former Texas Tech. Quarterback great. So Ryan Walters, the defensive-minded head coach, made the move from, from Illinois over to Purdue, and it just has not had the impact that the program was hoping for especially when you laid out the defensive stats that they had. Not a good recipe for success when you're, I think they're 16th out of 18th on offense among Big Big Ten teams and then dead last in defense. So can't score the ball and you can't stop your opponent. Not going to win too many football games. But, Mm -hmm. I mean, you do have Hudson Card. Uh, He's a transfer from Texas, like you mentioned, just getting sacked on on a just far too often and a lot of it just has to do to the fact that they're just getting behind in games early and often and having no choice but but to uh have to throw the football so uh it's it's definitely been a, a tough year i think when you look at this ball game in general for penn state it's what i would call a byoe game bring your own energy where we saw what that environment could look like in West La- or can look like in West Lafayette when you go back a couple of years ago when they were there mm-hmm. in the season opener, uh, which I think could spell well for Penn State. It's it's Drew Aller where he made his debut. That's where Abdul Carter uh, played one snap and got ejected on the first play. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, for, first for targeting. So this could be a you know a little. They ended up winning that ball game, obviously, but a little bit of a sweet revenge for those guys coming back. But for for Walters and Co., yeah, it's it's been a it's been a tough tough year to to really get anything going. And he is absolutely on the hot seat as this season winds down and comes to a close, as they have not been able to stop stop their opponents or, like I said, produce any points on offense. Yeah, and his, I mean, his transfer. Hudson Carr card from Texas is just not having a good year. Eight touchdowns to five interceptions, only 6.6 yards per completion. And is throwing above 60% uh, while under pressure. All those numbers are under pressure. And like I said, he's been sacked 24 times. So 
he's going to be under pressure a lot of the times, which is where I think they're going to lean on my Boilermaker impact player at the game. Switching it up here a little bit. Number 45, the running back, Devin Mockaby, a six foot, 207 pound true junior who leads the team with four total touchdowns. That's pretty awful. Ran for 612 yards this season on 104 carries. That's 5.9 yards per attempt. He's also the team's fourth leading receiver with 13 receptions, 123 yards. So combining that all together, you give him the ball, he's getting a 6.2 yards when he touches it. And I noticed that Hudson Card really went to him. It He is just the check down receiver, but yeah, Hudson yeah. Card was just treating him like he was his main target every single time because the rush just gets there so incredibly fast. And defensively, it was really hard to pick one. I mean, we've talked about the numbers. Not much to say about this defense. I will say maybe the most talented player, number four, Kedron Jenkins, senior. I saw him all over the field uh, last week. Um, found out researching him, team leader in sacks with five and a half and run stops, 21 from the season, and also second in pressures with 22. But tall, tall task for this kid against the Penn State rushing offense as well as a pass defender where he has struggled. Against 16 passes against him, he's allowed 12 catches for 214 yards. That's almost 18 yards per catch against him. Two touchdowns, a coverage penalty, no pass breakups, four interceptions. So... If we find him in coverage, definitely take advantage of number four, Kedron Jenkins. But other than that, he's their leader on that defensive unit. That lowly defensive unit. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any players? I mean, looking at this roster, it's not much to write home about, like you said, but any other players that we should be worried about? Any p- impact players that could turn some tides, possible upset in West Lafayette. Yeah, there's a couple. And sorry, just going back real quick to, to Maccabi. It's it's also a little bit of a shame because he has definitely been effective when he's gotten the opportunities. But like we were talking about, they've just been down in ball games way too early where they can't fully utilize him. <laughs> and he's just been yeah. missing in action for most of the games. And then – uh for him also in general, Franklin joked about it in his presser this week where it does seem like he's been there forever. It does feel like mockaby has been there for at least five, six years. But, yeah. but he was a he was a key component in that 2022 game, uh, that season opener. But yeah, forgot to say yeah, yeah, he shares the backfield with uh Reggie Love the third. Yeah. I think it's the third. But yeah, they basically split carries, which is mm-hmm. kind of weird, even though he has 104 in the year and Reggie Love has 73. Yeah. So to get Reggie Love prepared for the rest of his Purdue career. Yeah, but uh just just round out just a couple other guys to look out for. So on the offensive side of the ball, you got sophomore tight end Max Clare, number 86. He's definitely targeted or the the heaviest targeted on offense through the air. 48 targets on the year, 32 catches. 474 yards, only two touchdowns. Uh, but again, this Purdue offense has not produced many touchdowns. So two yeah. of them is a lot. Uh, but Hudson six Clark, four. I saw him throw like literally in a triple coverage trying to get to this kid. He <laughs> ab- he's absolutely loves him. Security blanket <laughs> to the man. <Yeah. laughs> but uh, but yeah, six four, two forties, big target from San Xavier High School, uh, big high school program in Cincinnati. Uh, leads the team in receptions on the year. Like we, like you mentioned, heaviest targeted, uh, averaging 14.8 yards per catch. So when he is getting the rock, he, he's creating some some big plays for him. But 
he's definitely the focal point of the offense outside of of Maccabi. And then on defense, just another name to look out for, Will Help, sophomore defensive end, number 15. Big, big body, 6'6", 265. Uh, he's up there with with Jenkins, who you already talked about, with total sacks on the air. He's got five sacks on the season, 30 total tackles. So, again, not a household name, but is a, a, someone to look out for that Penn State's offensive line should be able to handle, uh, but is one of the, the, I guess what you would call one of their, their upper tier defensive pieces. Yeah, big boy. And uh, going back to Max Clare. He's also another huge guy, huge target for card to throw to, but I'm totally confident in Jaden Reed and Zaki Wheelie being able to shut him down. So let's go to some matchups that we need to win. Mine are pretty simple. Just don't shoot ourselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. Penalties, looking at it on the season, it's almost even. Penn State's committed. Excuse me. 43 penalties on the season, Purdue 53. So to put it into one player or a unit, I'm going to go with the centerpiece and captain of the offensive trenches, Nick Dawkins, along with that entire offensive line. One, to stay out of trouble penalty-wise, and two, to absolutely bully Purdue into submission so we can get the second team some run. And secondly, talked about before, Devin Maccabi against Kobe King, who's having one of the most underrated seasons at linebacker in quite some time. He's not being talked about enough, in my opinion. He's all over the field, only has four missed tackles this season. So Mm -hmm. that's going to be a big matchup. Uh, Mock could be running the ball, Mock could be getting it on screens, and Kobe King having to fight through blockers, getting to him, bringing him down. Confident that he can do that. Yeah, I think King also saw has been, uh, for for PFF, has been si- uh, graded 65 or higher in six straight games, I believe. So definitely uh, been there having an impact. Thank you. There we go, PFF. Recognize. You recognize real. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, matchups to win. Again, like you said, I think it's a simple formula in this one. Uh, so I think the one that you called out, um, just not beating ourselves, not shooting ourselves in the foot, is definitely, definitely one of them. But also, I think the other is just shutting down Maccabi, as most opponents have. Done the fun name to say, by the way, Maccabi. Maccabi. Uh, but getting them shut down early, forcing them to throw the ball, uh, getting them down in distance, and uh, creating some some havoc in the backfield, getting to getting a car, getting them on the ground, but also making them throw some prayers up there and be able to create some turnovers. Um, so I think shutting down that run game, forcing them to throw the ball. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, this is a it's a BYOE. It's a bring your own energy game that the crowd, it it has the ability to be a ruckus environment, but the way that they've played so far this year and with, with that record shows being at one and seven is very well could be a low turnout game from a crowd standpoint. So I think if there is anyone in the stadium taking them out of it very early and, uh, Less of a matchup to win and more so of a key, but you want to make sure that you take care of business early and get your young guys in there uh, to be able to get a a good look at them to see who, if any, could potentially contribute down the stretch and even talk about the playoffs with the benefits of not having to burn someone's red shirt and allowing them to play uh, in the playoffs, I think is huge. So being able to get your starters out of there early and get the young guys in, get a good look at them and get them some more snaps, I think is going to be critical. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's really the huge key, getting the lead, getting the second team some run, which yeah. they desperately need. Um, did you see the stuff about Ohio State, um, about how like they only play noon games and it's basically because their boosters are just like, yeah, we don't want to stay up late. 
I did not see that. Yeah, it was I forget where I saw it, but yeah, it was basically like they only they play like a couple like two, maybe one night game. Hmm. But every yeah, everyone's talking about how Ohio State only plays at noon. And it's apparently their uh Brian Day was like, Yeah, it's basically the boosters just not wanting wow. to stay late for games. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, you I had play, seen, I know play, uh there was a NCAA. lot of you can't just let them get away with that. That's insane. Yeah, that I did see uh I think it was Joe Clatt or was Joe Clatt from Fox was because obviously Fox Big Noon gets a lot of scrutiny. Folks don't want the games to be at noon. Ruins potentially some traditions like the whiteout where you want that to be against a team like Ohio State, but there was a lot of interaction going back and forth where for him as being a Fox broadcaster, he's he's obviously gonna promote that. And there was there I did see a lot of backlash from Big Ten folks just saying how it's ruining, uh, you know, some of these key matchups. But yeah, did not see that about the boosters playing a role in that. So that's very interesting. Yeah, it floored me. Could, <laughs> could not believe that. Um, so finally, let's go with our Iron Lions. Despite. Purdue having the worst run defense. I'm going to go with a wide receiver here. I think Trey Wallace is going to have his second 100-yard receiving game of his collegiate career. First one was week one against West Virginia. They're, again, awful against both the run and the pass, but I think we... Again, try to get Drew Aller and that offense going early, taking deep shots. Mm-hmm. Trey Wallace, that deep target. Seeing a lot of clips of Amari Evans in practice, getting some deep targets from Drew Aller. I think he only has three catches so far in Big Ten play. So maybe looking to get him, uh, the big Zamboni, looking to get Amari Evans rolling this game as well. But I think, yeah, Trey Wallace is going to be my iron line to watch, and I'm calling for a 100-yard receiving game from him. Dig it. You and I have the same train of thought with the wide receiver group, so I'm sticking within that group. I'm going to go with Julian Fleming. Nice. The PA kid got his first, first touchdown of the year, but I was going to say first Beaver Stadium touchdown in Penn State uniform. So... That was great to see, and for me, hoping that that's the juice that he needed to really get him going. Uh, he's been uh, hasn't shown up a lot in the box score this year. He's been an out more of an outstanding blocker, and has definitely continued to be a, a key contributor for the offense. But for me, just personally, I would love to just have this be his breakout game, and just see him go. Uh, need one. Need one. Need one. Need before a breakout game from Fleming before he eventually gets pulled uh, for for the younger guys. So for me, that's him. And then I got one more for you. I'm looking for Max Granville, a true freshman who had reclassified or reclassed himself into this class. Kid should still be in high school and been getting a ton of rave through camp and from the coaching staff and how he's been able to be prepared all year. He's been on the travel roster all year long, all year long rather. And he's at the spot now where I believe he can play the rest of these games and not burn his red shirt. So expecting yeah, him had, to get he a lot. In the Kent State game. Kent State, yep. He had a nice pressure. He just bulldozed the right tackle or their left tackle on the right side. Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely uh, definitely a kid who's got a high, high ceiling, especially when we look at Abdul Carter, who's likely playing him playing his way into a potential top 10, top 15, definitely round one uh, pick next year in the draft. So you're say that. Get I, want, a... I want the Eagles to get him. That's true. Yeah, pick number 32. He's going yeah. 32. For but, sure. Uh, For sure. <laughs> but uh, got to get a good look at who's who's going to replace him. So I think Granville is definitely a, a key candidate here when I think he's going to get his first sack. Yeah. That's a, that's a bull call. Love it. And yeah, like we said, those second unit reps last year, a lot of coaches ragged on James Franklin for kind of running up the score, but they are important. 
yep. for the sustainability and future of the program. So with that, we are going to go with three weeks left in the college football season. We're going to put this in week number 12 of the Big Ten betting bonanza. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all tied up record-wise. A little discrepancy in the points, but roll the intro. Week number 12. Here we go. It is week number 12 of the Big Ten betting bonanza as we head down the final three weeks into bowl season, playing for the prestigious 10-pound Big Ten Dumbbell Trophy. Last week, week 11, shook some things up. Dave hit his Penn State Washington under 46 and a half, lost Oregon minus 24 and a half against Maryland. That came, yeah, 21 point difference, tough mm-hmm. loss there, but did hit the Rutgers money line, which I was so pissed. Took. I should have taken, should have taken that to pick before. Cleek Manis throwing three touchdowns and a 26 19 win. So that's plus three minutes of points. Changing up the trajectory of how this competition should have gone. So last week, two and one, plus four bonanza points. That brings him to 14, 15, and one with 16 bonanza points on the season. Last week for me, last week for me, not as good. Letting Dave creep back into this, which I don't want. I had the Friday night fever game, Iowa against UCLA, under 44 and a half. That finished 20 to 17, full touchdown under. Reveling in that because that was my only win of the weekend. I lost on the Maryland team total under 14 and a half. They ended up with 18, including a 62-yard defensive fumble recovery, (laughs) which I think they scored one offensive touchdown. So Um, really should have won that bet. Really should have won that bet. And then got over my skis. Thought Indiana was just going to keep rolling, rolling, rolling. Only won 20 to 15 against Michigan. So last week, one and two, only one point for the season. No, I'm not repeating myself. I am 14, 15, and one. Both of us with the same exact record through 11 weeks of betting. However, I'm up on banana po- banana points, bananza points with 20. With, I think, three money line wins. But Dave had that one right back in it. And it's check ball to him because he won last week. So... I only have three picks this week, so if you take one of mine, I am going to scramble for that last one. All right. And I need a good week this week. So we got a... Grappling is a four-point deficit, 20-16. to Is that where we're at? Uh, Yes, you're down. Yeah, four four bananas points. 16. All right, for my first pick... Going there's also, there's also victory in having a good record. True. If you Very don't want to, you know, try to try to beat me at bonanza points. Give me the treasure chest. Very true. <laughs> For first pick, I'm gonna stick with your or with the Friday night fever, which UCLA Love has it. uh frequented the Friday night games, it feels like. Yeah, as they're really, going back to back on Friday nights. They really have at Washington, 
UCLA is plus four in this one. Deshaun Foster has found a little bit of a groove with the Bruins as they've won two of their last three against Rutgers in Nebraska and had a close battle with the Hawkeyes. I think UCLA keeps that train rolling and they win outright here. So I'm going with the Bruins money line. And I got them at plus four in this one against the Huskies. In that classic Big Ten battle, UCLA Washington. Classic. Friday night, Big Ten battle. Uh what was the money line? Uh mm-hmm. let me plus. get the should be or, or, I got them at plus one fifty five. Plus one fifty five. That's a nice play. Yeah. That was all that was on my board. UCLA very very stout run defense, even though mm-hmm. their record doesn't really show it. Washington mm-hmm. can pass the ball, but Jonah Coleman's a beast, and mm-hmm. it's just going to be a clash of the Titans there. I'm going to go. All right. So, since you did that, I'm going to steal my pick back. I'm going to the six o'clock Ox Sports one game. Rutgers at Maryland, the mid-Atlantic battle. I think Maryland absolutely stinks. They can put up numbers when they want to. They have some skilled players, but I don't think that that locker room is put together at all. I think that they're kind of struggling. So, weird line, then minus five against Rutgers. So Rutgers won last week without uh, without Kyle Monangai, who's back mm-hmm. this week. So I have them as plus where is it? Plus five. So I'm taking Rutgers money line oh. and plus one eighty five. Stealing that money line back from you. <laughs> Maybe I'm missing something with Rutgers, but with Kalik Bannis throwing three touchdowns and Monongai coming back, maybe I'm the the square here. But Shiano's got the magic back in Piscataway. Give me that money line for the Bonanza. I would recommend taking those points, though, if you were going to. I You stole the words out of my mouth. I'm sticking with that game. I'm taking <laughs> the over 52 and a half. Like you said, Maryland puts up points. Rucker is actually uh, has been in a couple high scoring fairs last couple of weeks. I love the bet there with the Rucker's money line, but I definitely think this one hits on the over. So I got the over. All righty. So back I'm to gonna, you. I'm going to go to the NBC Big Ten primetime game, 7 30 ah, p.m. Yeah. Oregon, eight straight games in a row before their bye week next week. So they're definitely looking forward to that. Healing up, Tez Johnson, their stud wide receiver, unfortunately is out. So their past games, this is their travel schedule. They were home at Illinois. Then they had to go to Ann Arbor to face Michigan, back home against Maryland, and now they're going to Camp Randall for the 730 Big Ten slate. Number one team in the nation, Dylan Gabriel dinks and dunks down the field. That defense is for real. Open pressure on the quarterback nonstop. However, Wisconsin's different. Wisconsin is different environment at night. Camp Randall gets it going. I think they're going to lose this game, 100% going to lose this game. But I think they keep it close enough where they can cover this first half spread of plus seven and a half. So that'll be my second pick. Wisconsin plus seven and a half first half. I like it. 
My only concern is Oregon. Yeah, they just get after the quarterback, and Wisconsin does not have the best run defense. So Jordan James could mm -hmm. beat them up. Only concern there. All right, your last pick. Buddy. Concern. All right, last pick going to the four p.m. Fox time slot. We got the Nebraska Cornhuskers, and you did it, and you did it. Well, maybe not. At the USC Trojans, we got some shakeups going on in this game as Nebraska has moved on to a new offensive coordinator. We got familiar name, familiar face, Dana Holgerson. Is the new offensive coordinator for Nebraska after Marcus uh, Satterfield was relieved of his duties. You got USC starting a new quarterback, moving on from Miller Moss. Miller Moss hitting hitting the bench, and they got Jaden Maeva starting uh, for USC. So during that misery of a loss, when Miller Moss tossed six touchdowns. Mm -hmm. And you told me, hey, guess next year he's going to be benched by week 12. I would be like, fuck you, dude. He's a yeah. <laughs> game of his life against us right now. Like, this is absurd. Yeah. So, yeah, clearly not a dude. Yeah, hitting the pine, uh, probably hitting the portal as well. Yeah. Nebraska, plus seven and a half in this one. I'm going bolder than seven and a half. I'm going with the Nebraska money line in what? LA. Matt Rule got his new guy calling the offense, Dana Holgerson. You know, he can sling the rock, he can get some points on the board. Give me Nebraska. They're five and four. They're searching for a bowl game, and they win this one outright. I had him at plus 240 last time I checked. All right. So I'm swinging for the fence here with my third and final pick. Give me the Horn Huskers. Bodie, that would be a plus fiver. Plus fiver, baby. That would probably put you in the lead. Yeah. Let's see what I want to do here. Let's make this a battle. All right. So one thing you forgot to mention is that USC is going to be wearing their 1972 throwback uniforms. Oh, I am I a that. full subscriber to cool uniforms equals cool play. Mm -hmm. Look good, play oh, good. The spread's minus seven and a half here. I'm going to take that. Mm. Let's see, minus seven and a half. Wearing the 1972 throwback uniforms. Because you took my. Well, I could have took in. I could have took Nebraska plus seven and a half, actually. Mm -hmm. But that's not fun. Nah. Make it do it. Have to spread. Let's battle. Come on. Yeah. Trojans versus Corn Huskers. Imagine <laughs> how that would go. Big 10, <laughs> baby. <laughs> I'd be imagine getting to take it to that gladiator fight. Oof. Yeah. Off with the head. <laughs> well, that will do it. You can either trail our picks, fade our picks, maybe a little mix in between, depending on how you like our explanations of which one we're doing. I think the 1972 throwbacks are pretty much the best explanation to take. Mm -hmm. See there. But this week is really going to be pivotal for this competition. And we want to thank you all once again for tuning in, listening to two guys talk about something they love, Penn State football, as we head at Purdue, week number 12, looking for our ninth win, looking to move up in that awesome, awesome-looking college football playoff bracket and thank you for all your support on every single platform we like literally it means the world to us if you're listening to this right now it really does mm -hmm. and we will be back after Penn State 
definitely kicks Purdue's ass. And we feature the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Get ready for that to be said a ton next week. Minnesota. Love you guys. Love you guys.